We are delighted to have Rita Ferrone as our guest speaker. Rita received her MDiv from the Yale Divinity School in 1983, and since that time has worked for the Catholic Church as a parish liturgy director, diocesan director of adult initiation, and an independent writer, teacher, and speaker across the US. In addition to working with the North American Forum on the Catechumenate, Rita serves on the advisory board of the Yale Institute on Sacred Music and teaches in their summer seminar for congregational leaders. She is the author of several books, including Source Book for Sundays and Seasons on the Right of Election. Uh, most recently, uh, Liturgy, and here I'm selling, okay, Sacrosanctum Concilium, which is uh, a reflection on uh, rediscovering the, the Second a, a series called Rediscovering the Second Vatican Council. Um, and she won the Catholic Press Association Award for this text. She also co-authored a series, Foundations in Faith. I think I've got the wrong number. It's a heroic number of volumes, like 18. Is that true? Wow. There's so <laughs> Nevertheless, wow. She's a frequent contributor to Commonweal, America, Worship, and other journals. Her 2009 article in Commonweal on the Exultant won a Best of the Christian Press Award from the Associated Church Press. She's also a, a regular contributor uh, and substitute editor for the Tr Pray Tell blog and contributes also to the publication Give Us This Day. If you haven't seen her reflection on Pope Francis, uh, it's just very, very well done. Um, a native New Yorker, uh, she grew up in Manhattan and contrary to Midwest expectations, she's a really nice person. <laughs> very calm, very calm. She lives with her husband in Mount Vernon, New York. Um, the title of her presentation is Liturgy and Social Justice, Fresh Challenges for Today and Virgil Michael's Legacy. Please give Rita a warm Collegeville welcome. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. And just to put another word on this whole East Coast Midwest thing, I just want to say I am delighted. I've always loved the Upper Midwest. I spent five very happy years in Milwaukee, and Minnesota is a great uh, state, so I feel very happy to, to be here among you. And I'll try to speak slow, more slowly than I would at home. <laughs> to, today we meet at a time of great economic injustice in the United States and in the world. The poor remain poor, while the rich we've had to invent a new word for, which is the super rich. There are a lot of things that we could talk about with justice issues other than poverty, but I thought for the sake of simply highlighting one example, the justice questions in income inequality might be a place for us to stir our imaginations as we prepare to give some thought to what social justice and the liturgy might have to say to us today. Income inequality in uh, the United States stands at heights only previously known in the Great Depression. Uh, this text I have here is from that impeccable source, Wikipedia. <laughs> Actually, this one is a very well-researched article, and I thought it summed up a lot of important things. Over the past 40 years, studies have indicated the source of the widening gap, sometimes called the Great Divergence, has not been gender inequality, which has declined in the U.S. over the last several decades, nor inequality between black and white Americans, which has stagnated during that time, nor has the gap between the poor and the middle class been the major cause, though it has grown. But most of the growth in income inequality has been between the middle class and top earners, with the disparity becoming more extreme the further one goes up in the income distribution. 
upward redistribution of income is responsible for about 43% of the projected social security shortfall over the, the next 75 years. The Brookings Institute said in 2013 that income inequality was increasing and becoming permanent, reducing social mobility in the United States. These facts underlie the Occupy movement. First to break out in Occupy Wall Street, 17th of September in 2011, so we're getting even closer in time to right now, this moment in time. The Occupy protest movement has since erupted in 600 communities across the United States and 81 other countries besides. Every content, continent except Antarctica. I suppose the penguins are you know, not worried too much about income inequality. Uh, and these facts uh, underlie the Occupy movement. If you look at those graphs, it tells a tale. Now, poll data has shown that most Americans think that income is much more evenly distributed than it actually is. The problem is that since they don't believe that it is as unequal as it is, there's not that much energy about changing the situation. This is a wonderful little chart here. of The actual distribution of wealth, we have a very wealthy country, but the actual distribution of wealth at the top 20% is more than 80% of the wealth. What Americans think it is, is about between 50 and 60. What they would like it to be is around 35%. So uh, we are in a situation not only of great inequality, but of great amnesia about what it is that's going on, the great uh, blindness to the facts that are relevant here. So this past fall, the Catholic Church in America had on full display a clash of expectations regarding what is the right attitude for Catholics to take about various economic issues. And our varying views regarding social justice could not have been more marked. September 14, 2012, the National Catholic Reporter reported quoting uh, Cardinal Chapu of Philadelphia saying, Jesus tells us that if we don't help the poor, we're going to hell, period. There's just no doubt about it. That has to be a foundational concern of Catholics and of all Christians. But Jesus didn't say the government has to take care of them or that we have to pay taxes to take care of them. Those are prudential judgments. Anybody who would condemn someone because of their position on taxes is making a leap that I can't make as a Catholic. Fall 2012, from the website of the nuns on the bus, we hear this. As Catholic sisters, we must speak out against the current House Republican budget authored by Rev Representative Paul Ryan, Republican of Wisconsin. We do so because it harms people who are already suffering. The Ryan budget would raise taxes on 18 million hardworking low-income families while cutting taxes for millionaires and big corporations, income distribution. Push the families of 2 million children into poverty, kick 8 million people off food stamps, and 30 million off health care. Now, into the maelstrom of all this ferment about what is going on with justice in our country and what should we think about that? What should we do about that? Comes another announcement. Dorothy Day's canonization has been unanimously approved by a vote of the United States Catholic Bishops Conference. November 26, 2012, the New York Times reporting William Donahue, president of the Catholic League, who said, 
It is an opportunity for him, Cardinal Dolan, president of the USCCB, to demonstrate that conservative Catholics are not uncaring without accepting liberal positions in how you service the poor. She, Dorothy Day, was not, like many liberal Catholics today, a welfare state enthusiast. Francis Cardinal George, quoted in the same article, as we struggle at this opportune moment to try to show how we are losing our freedoms in the name of individual rights, Dorothy Day is a very good woman to have on our side. <laughs> to all of this, Robert Ellsberg, a former editor of the Catholic Worker newspaper and the editor of Day's letters and diaries, said, quote, I think she would be appalled to have her commitment to voluntary poverty and works of mercy and charity in their deepest sense be used as a cover for an agent's agenda that I think she would regard as part of a war against the poor. Eugene McCarraher wrote in an article interestingly entitled The Church Irrelevant <laughs> in Religion in American Culture, he says, when prophets are honored, it's time to be wary. Placing prophets on pedestals can be a way not only of disarming them, but of avoiding the lessons they can teach. The website for the uh, uh, clause of canonization of Dorothy Day has a quote of Day's, which uh, I think is, is very interesting also to read. Always present for Dorothy Day was a question expressed in her autobiography, The Long Loneliness. And here it is on the screen. Why was so much done in remedying evil instead of avoiding it in the first place? Where were the saints to try to change the social order, not just to minister to slaves, but to do away with slavery? Now, today, we remain in a situation worldwide where the wealth spent on arms and armaments could lift every human being on the planet out of destitution if it were spent on human needs. In that, I am quoting Pope Benedict XVI in his apostolic exhortation, Sacramentum Caritatis. As much as Pope Benedict has been quoted, I don't think that statement has made the rounds. So I, I mention it. Now, today, we hear from our new Pope, Pope Francis, saying at his inaugural mass, how I would like a poor church a church of the poor. We stand at a moment in time when the Catholic Church in America is facing questions about what is its social vision and how does it live this out. Where are the saints who try to change the social order, not just to minister to slaves, but to do away with slavery? Dorothy Day's question comes back again to haunt us. Which brings us to Virgil Michael, OSB. Surely he is one of the saints who tried to change things. He did this by writing, by teaching, by analyzing and critiquing predatory capitalism, which was, by the way, plenty predatory in the 1920s, long before Ayn Rand and the cult of radical individualism uh, flourished that lion was lionized in her novel Atlas Shrugged, which was written in 1957. And by the way, I don't know if any of you do this sort of thing. I've looked in uh, uh, Amazon to see what her sales ratings are not just to compare them to my book on Sacred of Concilium, <laughs> which would be a big joke, but just to see, well, gee, you know, how popular is this book? And uh, Ayn Rand ranks number four in authors of literature classics. I'll have you know, she uh, beat out Jane Austen and Leo Tolstoy, Charles Dickens, and quite a few other authors. Of course, she was beat out by F. Scott Fitzgerald, J.R.R. Tolkien, and improbably by someone named Stephen Chbosky, who wrote The Perks of a Wallflower. <laughs> I suppose if you write a teenager's book that's put on a movie, that you can really jump ahead of the crowd there in the sales range. But, and 
It's safe to say, however, that the popularity of Ayn Rand is not due to the literary merits of her, of her uh, uh, novels, but due to the ideas that they express and a per personal vision of capitalism that would be the kind of thing that Virgil Michael would have critiqued if he were alive today. Virgil Michael perceived idolatry in the unbridled uh, pursuit of wealth and in what he called individualism, meaning all of those things which set the individual against the good of the whole. Virgil Michael taught that that is an abomination. Following Pius XI's uh, encyclical Quadragesimo Anno, he referred to it as a pagan creed. But what was his solution? Collaborative farming, workers' movements, labor unions? He applauded and supported many such initiatives. Yet his contribution was not, first of all, as an economist, not as a union organizer, not as someone who ran a hospitality house or a farm cooperative. Rather, his calling was expressed in the task of deepening the spiritual basis of all these good things through engagement with the liturgy. True deepening in Virgil Michael's vision could only be achieved through active participation in the liturgy. The idea that the liturgy is essential to social regeneration, which is what he called it, social regeneration or social reconstruction, to social justice, we might call it today, was his signal contribution to Catholic renewal in the liturgical movement of the early 20th century. Now, Mark Serrell clarified beautifully in an essay he wrote uh, in 1980 that the justice we are talking about here when we talk about social regeneration and social justice is not the same as justice experienced in a legal sense. Uh, what he said was that justice in the legal sense is a very limited sense of legal redress, of restraining evil. But such justice can do no more than that. Searle said, instead, what the justice is that we talk about in liturgy is human flourishing. It is justice that arises from finding and living from who we are together at the deepest level, the body of Christ in the world. The liturgy is about God's justice, and that's the justice which brings forth life in abundance. Michael saw the liturgy as our lived enactment of the spiritual reality of the body of Christ. The body of Christ, as many of you have all, would know, is the refrain that just is constantly woven throughout his works, that we are the mystical body of Christ. That is to say, the people of the church are Christ's body mystically participating in the life of the Savior, in his very self, in the world. It, it, Michael saw the liturgy as an enactment of the spirituality in which one, no one can say to another, I don't need you. Virgil Michael understood this and tried mightily to convey it to others. The connection between liturgy and social justice was the American contribution to the liturgical movement in its most outstanding form. Uh, the international liturgical movement, which began, most scholars see it, uh, you know, starting in the 19th century, but really beginning properly in 1909 with Father Lambert Baudouin, uh, who, uh, uh, it, a Belgian uh, Benedictine, who uh, started this as a movement proper outside of the solely monastic context it had been in before and into the wider church. And this liturgical movement reached its uh, apogee in the reforms of the Second Vatican Council. And the contribution of linking social justice with the liturgical movement was really Virgil Michael's gift to that international phenomenon. It came through him, and it came from here, from St. John's. It came through Orate Fratres, which Michael founded. It came through liturgical press, which he founded, and through the schools that Michael toiled to expand and enrich with good pedagogy that would integrate the lived experience of the liturgy with all the disciplines of learning. 
I feel when I'm here talking about Virgil Michael, I stand on holy ground. And I am so privileged to be here with you today to reflect on what he has given us and what we still have as a kind of insight to carry forward into the future. Father Virgil Michael, what was he like? One of the reasons I picked this topic was because I wanted to find out more about him. What was he like? And to read more and to get a feel for this person. Because I think sometimes, you know, we can get a person's ideas, but when you know what the person is like, it helps you to also uh, have an imaginative engagement with how do we do some of the extraordinary things he does. Uh, n not many of us are going to get a PhD in two years like he did or, you know, different things like that. But there are other ways that he, uh, his life is sort of inspiring, uh, and I've, I find it so. So I, three images for reflection. The first one uh, was in his youth. Oh, wait a moment. I have to back up here. I had one other thing to say, just a few general things about him. He was brilliant, yet had a very practical mind. He was a teacher, yet also a visionary. He was German by heredity, yet truly American with a can-do attitude and positive energy for leaning into the future. He was a s seriously devout and strictly loyal Catholic, loyal to the Pope as Christ's vicar on earth. His view of Catholicism was formed by the church of the so-called long 19th century. At the same time, he was well aware of the weaknesses of the church, both in the US and in Europe, of the apathy and the appalling failures of the church to educate, to teach, to reform, to live out of its deepest and truest self. He was not, as his biographer, Father Paul Marx, admitted, a very good economist, but he was good with theological praxis, good with languages, a good educator. Above all, he was a person of indefatigable energy. A bibliography of his writings during his brief lifespan of 48 years ran to 13 pages, tightly spaced. I even thought it was a little bit less than single-spaced. <laughs> I was looking at these things. How many things do they fit on these pages? He was a, an amazing writer. Uh, and. Uh, uh, never was there a day that he didn't write something, according to his biographer, and it was not unusual to find him writing on two or three subjects in a particular day, uh, not to mention the time he spent speaking, teaching in the classroom, other settings. He organized conventions. He went out to see people. He had correspondence of a lively kind with people all over. So the three images, him as a youth, talking to Father Alcuin Deutsch, who was one of his teachers before he became the abbot, who asked him while he was still a young student if he might have a vocation to become a monk. His response was, and I quote, Father Alquin, if monasticism were what it once was, I would enter St. John's Abbey. Now, don't you think that's a little cheeky? <laughs> If monasticism were what it once was, I mean, I went to Catholic schools. You didn't say that sort of thing to your teachers. <laughs> You'd get detention for being, you know, uppity or something. Uh, a critic it, it, as a teenager, even, you know, he had to think, well, it's not really good enough now. But if it, had, if it was what it once was, you know, that would be a different story. But then there's his response. He goes ahead and does it. He goes ahead and does it persuaded by Father Deutsch that the Abbey could be, like monasticism of old, a center of spirituality, learning, and scholarship, he joined and added the full measure of his own talents to this community, contributing to a flourishing of spirituality, learning, and scholarship for the whole American church. I like this image because I think the boy is father to the man. He often looked upon his world with a clear-eyed appraisal of what it lacked. He said religious education in America is abysmal. He said things like liturgical participation in this country is pitiful. He said things like cutthroat capitalism is destroying our common life. But he didn't just, as probably I would, you know, say, Gosh, these are, there are too many problems. I'm going to have a nice cup of tea and read a novel <laughs> and kind of sh shut out all of these things because I, I can't cope with it. He went out 
and he did something about it. He had the vigor and the, the drive to try to address those things which he saw to be less than what they could have been. The second one I have here, Liturgy at the Catholic Worker. I don't know how many of you knew that Father Michael was a friend of Dorothy Day and Peter Morin. Some of you know this. Uh, and uh, as was uh, Abbot uh, Deutsch, and a, a friend to the Catholic Worker. He sent them books from liturgical press, which according to accounts, they devoured. They just opened these boxes and were like pawing through the books. They were so excited to get the latest shipment of books from liturgical press. Uh, he taught them to pray the hours. He'd go to the Catholic worker houses, teach them to pray the hours, and he sent them booklets to use that had Latin and English next to them so that they could understand what they were praying and engage with it. So here's the image from Stanley Vishnevsky's book, Wings of the Dawn, describing an ordinary day at the Catholic worker. Quote, every evening at seven, Margaret or Big Dan would start banging on a dishpan or a handy pot, and its clamorous noise resounding throughout the store would summon us to the kitchen, where, facing each other in two rows, we would recite the Office of Compline. Not only the hours, but also the Eucharist was part of the routine of the Catholic Worker House. William Gaucher of the Cleveland Catholic Worker wrote about the appeal of the liturgy to the homeless in his 1940 book, Helping the Hobo to God. I love some of these old books. You know, you couldn't, I think, publish a book today that it's called people hobos, right? <laughs> Another one of my favorites in the 1950s was God Loves the Pagans. That was a, it was a, it was a great book. It was a great book. You, yeah, well, anyway, those days are gone. So, <laughs> helping the hobo to God. But this is a great quote. The poor who have nothing and are despised by everyone for having nothing. Despised by everyone for having nothing can offer to God a gift of infinite value in the Mass. At Mass, the poor are rich, and the rich are more, are no more than the poorest of the poor. So the image of people banging pots to summon the homeless, to recite Compline in the kitchen, is very piquant to me. And I see Virgil Michael was a part of that. They were doing that because of what he had done for that. They were singing, probably off key, quite a bit. Uh, this liturgy is hardly an aesthetic treasure. What it is, however, is a kind of miracle. Because of who's there, because of its patchwork of ordinariness and grandeur, because of these lives that are placed on the altar and joined together in the body of Christ to which you and I, by the mercy of God, also belong. The third uh, image. Virgil Michael sitting on a broken chair in a rundown storefront in Toronto, talking to Catherine de Hook and a discouraged group of volunteers when their Friendship House movement was nearing collapse. And he said, quote, you are discouraged. You need the mass. You must persevere by all means. You have a vocation. Study the mass. Live the mass. Between two masses, you can bear everything. They followed his prescription. They had mass. And the movement did, in fact, turn around. The Friendship House Movement in Canada. I, so this last one, I'm struck by his faith in the liturgy itself. I am struck by his bedrock confidence that the liturgy was the one thing needful to make efforts for justice and peace bear the sweet fruit of the kingdom of God. I am struck by this because it's so easy to become discouraged especially for those of us who have worked in the trenches of trying to make the liturgy live in its fullest sense. It's easy to become disheartened with the weaknesses of how we celebrate 
or with the quality of the music or the preaching or with the flaws in the translation or the cluelessness with which our rituals are sometimes presented and explained. And we've all known too many people who haven't been held by our liturgy, good people often enough, who in this pluralistic world have chosen simply to walk away. What in the world does this liturgy of ours have to offer to heal the world? Virgil Michael would answer, it has Christ. And through the liturgy, we become, in a mystical manner, the body of Christ in this world. So this is a question I would ask you as I ask it of myself. How many of us can say of the liturgy without arrogance, but with utter trust and faith, this will help? This is the answer to the disfigurements of the world. This will make our world whole again if we let it. That's what I hear Virgil Michael saying. Now his vision was simple. Active participation in the liturgy was integral to social reconstruction. It was sort of an A, B, C. I did a little chart there. Pope Pius X, uh, active participation in the liturgy is the indispensable source of the true Christian spirit, trale solicitudini. Very important to the liturgical movement. That's number one, point one. Point two, Pius XI, our second box, Pius XI. The true Christian spirit is needed for social reconstruction. And then, therefore, the third box, Virgil Michael. Therefore, active participation in the liturgy is needed for social reconstruction. It was a syllogism for him. It was that simple. And he was a good educator and did this sort of just talk people through these steps, and you'll see it fits together. He was critical of, capital, uh, of capitalism. He believed in the uh, necessity for the church of having things like Catholic action, the Catholic worker, the Campion propaganda movement, the friendship house, the grail, and more. The church needed these social movements. But also, and perhaps even more importantly, he believed that these social movements needed the liturgy. Alternatives to capitalism offered without God, he believed, would never solve the problem because, quoting the Gospels, without me you can do nothing. And he was convinced both that toxic individualism and the dehumanizing collectivism of some of the alternatives uh, at the time are both rooted in unbelief. So the unifying vision was undergirded by this theological concept of the mystical body of Christ. Through the liturgy, we enter that body and thus are related to all others in the body. The challenge was to become conscious of that union through active participation so that then we could live out of it more fully, so that we could incarnate that in all of our actions. Although the liturgical movement ultimately resulted in the reform of the liturgy, and rightly so, I think, Virgil Michael, like so many of the early leaders of the liturgical movement, was not so concerned about doing things to the liturgy at the time he lived. There wasn't all that much that people were doing or could do at that time. He was concerned rather about the liturgy doing things to us. And it would form us and make us whole once our willing cooperation with God's grace allowed the true Christian spirit to flow through the liturgy and into us and into our world. He understood this vision of participation in the liturgy as arising from the experience of the early church, the connection between liturgy and justice, that liturgy was the inspiration of every action. And here, here's a quote uh, from Orate Fratres in uh, an article that was published in 1940 after his death. What the early Christians thus did at the altar of God in the central act of Christian worship, they also lived out in their daily lives. They understood fully that the common action of worship was to be the inspiration of all their actions. They knew well that their common giving of themselves to God and to the brethren in Christ was in fact a solemn promise made to God that they would live their lives in this same love of God and God's children, their brethren in Christ, throughout all the day. 
Unless they did that, their action before God would be at best lip service, a lie before God. His connection with Dorothy Day and Peter Morin was particularly in interesting, I think. Uh, one of the little books I read in preparing uh, the, for this was uh, called The Revolutionary Politics of Dorothy Day, and I think there's a lot to that. She had a revolutionary uh, uh, understanding of what she did, and her practice was, in fact, something which turned around uh, expectations and was revolutionary in a sense. And uh, this was a kind of kenosis in her own life story. The Greek word kenosis, it means self-emptying. Uh, and which was the movement of Christ in the Incarnation, as described in the second chapter of the, Philipp of, of the letter to the Philippians. This emptying of himself through becoming human, Christ became human and thus he was accepting everything, even unto death, could be raised up by the Father uh, to glory. So the kenosis was key to the revolutionary politics of the Catholic worker. And you'll recall Dorothy Day discovered her calling to be with the lowest of the low, with the, 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 the poorest of the poor, in prison, when she went to prison for her uh, subversive activities. <laughs> Morin, her collaborator, was often mistaken for a bum, one who lived in so sedality. So the both of them were steeped in this idea that one lived poor in solidarity with the poor, and that emptying was the way to find your way through to a different way of being in this world. Very interesting. One of the things with the Catholic worker that uh, I find kind of interesting that they had a problem with using their taxes to pay for arms and armaments and war, so they found a way around that. They avoided paying taxes for war, co war costs by earning too little to be taxed. <laughs> so the, what Henry Nouwen called in his book Compassion, the downward pull, was very much incarnated in certain economic decisions that they made. And then last of all, the, 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 the paradox here that rather than erasing the individual, kenosis in union with Christ makes the person stronger because it's self-emptying in faith is not the same as destroying the self. It means that one can allow God to be God. And you emerge from that, individuals emerge from that stronger. Now, some people seek kenosis, others have it thrust upon them. And uh, for all his dynamo-like energies, or perhaps resulting from them, Virgil Michael suffered a crisis of nervous exhaustion in 1930. He had a breakdown. Uh, and it's a terrible thing, and anyone who has uh, known this or known uh, people close to you who have, done, who have experienced things like this, there's no romance about this. He had experienced sleeplessness, headaches, the inability to work or even to pray the hours as, as he so much wanted to do, a sense of emptiness of the cross. And in order to recover, he was sent up to northern Minnesota to live with the Chippewa. And it was there, among this very, in this very poor community, uh, culturally different and very much close to the earth, that he found life and solidarity and health again. And he thought he was better, he came back, he really wasn't better, and he was sent back to the Chippewa a second time and did it again. And then he was able to return in 1933 so his self-emptying through this breakdown and through his immersion with this very particular people, very lowly people who helped him to recover, these things were instrumental at arriving at a deeper level of insight and passion and a fuller grasp, I think, of the truths to which he had already committed his life. Virgil Michael died in 1938. Did his vision die with him? is the question. By the end of the late, uh, uh, by the late 1950s, uh, the notion of a fundamental connection between the liturgy and social justice had faded in the United States. Periodic attempts to revive the connection between these two spheres provided some literature in the 1980s, especially during the era of the great 
Peace and Economics Pastorals of the U.S. Bishops in the 1980s. Many of you will remember those. And again, there was another wave of interest in the 1990s. But by that time, the literature tended to be either forensic or speculative. Why had this connection died? Looking over the corpse to look and see what had happened here. Or was there any hope for revival of speculation? Uh, Catholic social teaching, of course, as we all know, has continued to offer a strong critique of economic and social life. The themes of solidarity, participation, human dignity, and more continue to emerge in the writings of popes and of the council. Uh, social ethics has continued apace. The Catechism of the Catholic Church says the liturgy commits us to the poor. And liturgy has continued to be about the reign of God. But for many people, for most people, I dare say, in the Catholic community, these two arenas, justice and liturgy, have been living separate lives. Would you agree with that? I don't know. But here we can think about this. Back in the 1970s, uh, you know, just a little, for instance, as a way to, to sort of take the temperature of that, uh, the contemporary music composer Tom Connery, who's pretty far out there if you know some of his music, but he had some good texts. One of the little texts he had in a Eucharistic song said, it was a spoken text which introduced uh, a, a Eucharistic uh, song, it said, anyone who comes to this table is saying, I believe in a new world, a world where bread is for everyone, the poor as much as for the rich. Now, today, I think a fair number of Catholics would be horrified if you told them anyone who comes to this table is saying, I believe in a new world. We even have trouble with that song, Sing a New Church. You know, people write to that publisher saying, what do you mean, sing a new church? We want the old one. Uh, it, uh, there's, there's, it's, not, it's not always a comfortable thing. I believe in a new world. Now, for what might be called movement people, people who still today, Catholic worker, Sant'Egidio, Pax Christi, highly committed groups, small in number, I think the answer is yes. They would say, I come to the table, and that is saying, I believe in a new world, a world where bread is for everyone, the poor as much as for the rich. And then for those committed to justice and peace, outreach and social ministry, human concerns in parishes and in dioceses, I think the answer is maybe. Um, that's my read. I've known a lot of these people. I, I love them very much. But you know, we're all still in this mode where a lot of people can do wonderful things in social justice. And then when they come to Mass, it's me and Jesus again. The Mass is not really about what we're doing in the soup kitchen. The mass is about recharging my spiritual battery personally and individually and not about who we are together. So, so some of them are on that page and some of them I think are on a different page. But for the majority of Catholics, that's the question. Virgil Michael's vision kind of didn't catch fire. So why not? There are a lot of, uh, there have been a lot of answers uh, the structuring of disciplines of study, you know, kept those things separate. The uh, failure to adapt to the New Deal after Michael's death and the things that happened in American politics. The radical nature of the claims were ill-suited to an age of pluralism. we more uh, worried about, you know, how are we in relationship to others. And his was a very Catholic vision, you know, that seems to be uh, all about the church being the answer, and we're seeing things through a different lens now. Uh, it, and some say there's a lacuna in the council document on the liturgy, which doesn't say much, so much about justice. So I'd like to just look at that last one of these. Uh, today, we're, we're celebrating also the 50th anniversary of the council, and I think this is a very good question. Did Vatican II drop the ball? Sister Mar Mary Margaret Kelleher, a liturgy professor from Catholic University, said in an article uh, in the American Catholic Historian, she voiced the opinion that at least part of the reason why Virgil Michael's vision of the close link between liturgy and social justice did not become universal is that the reform of the liturgy at Vatican II did not make that link explicit. And there's no question that she has a point. One looks in vain for a forceful and clear statement that the liturgy commits us to justice 
or refashion society in such a way that toxic individualism is ruled out or that any economic narcissism is likewise forbidden. One looks for this in the liturgy constitution and you don't find it. The link between liturgy and building a just society does not exactly jump off the page at the liturgy of the liturgy constitution. Yet, yet, consider the following. Paragraph 5, Article 5. The mission of Jesus is explicitly stated in the words of Luke's Gospel, Chapter 4, to preach good news to the poor. And believe me, you me, that was discussed. How are we going to describe Jesus' mission? To preach good news to the poor is up front in the liturgy constitution. Liturgy and the apostolate, liturgy flows into the apostolate and works of charity lead us back to the liturgy as the summit and source of the church's life, Article 10. So everything we do, all the works of charity and justice, are leading to the liturgy and flowing out of the liturgy. That's in the Constitution. That's in the Constitution. The perfect union with God and with one another is what the Eucharist draws us to. We may think a lot about the perfect union with God, but it does say in the Constitution, with God and with one another, that perfect union is what the Eucharist is drawing us to. The social consequences of sin are given attention, and the social dimensions of reconciliation are to be recovered. Article 109b, Article 110. It's not only the recovery of the prayer of the faithful, which of course allows us to speak about some of the justice concerns, or the encouragement to preaching, which allows us to preach the just word and to preach from a concern for justice. It's not only those things that opens the gate to social justice. It is also the overall ecclesiology of the Constitution which raises up the Eucharist as the model of communion and of life together. And the Eucharist, as you know, had to be reformed to bring this out clearly, and it was. Social concern was not lacking in the liturgy debate on the floor of the Council, as Kelleher also acknowledges. But she only cites a couple of interventions which were noted by Matthew Lambrix in Alberigo's History of Vatican II. In fact, there were more. Consider the invention of Bishop Manuel Larraín Arazuriz. Oh, well, someone can correct me later, my <laughs> pronunciation here, of Takla Chile, who, speaking on behalf of several Chilean bishops, I always count these as five. When you have five bishops are being spoken of from one, that's one intervention, but he's speaking for a group here. Okay. And uh, he spoke passionately in support of simplicity and evangelical sobriety in the liturgy. Recalling that Jesus announced the good news to the poor and that in salvation history, the poor are, quote, crowned with light. I like that phrase, that was very good. He invaded against secular vanities, what he called secular vanities in the church's liturgy. Quote, liturgical celebration ought to be beautiful. Genuine beauty, however, is in no way the splendor of riches or the splendor of pomps, but is, as the great Augustine said, the splendor of truth. And uh, he was concerned for the apostasy of the people at the lowest layers of society. He urged that the, and he called them the proletariat. So you know that the Marxism and so on was a concern in his, in his nation. Uh, the proletariat, he urged that the mystical body of Christ, I could see Virgil Michael must have been smiling from heaven when he said, that the mystical body of Christ might be revered throughout the earth and that the church might become not in word, but in action, the Church of the Poor, a term used by Pope John XXIII. And indeed, in the Constitution, noble simplicity rather than sumptuous display is presented as the norm of liturgical action, of liturgical art and artifacts. That the Church itself and its liturgy might be purged of inequalities arising from wealth and class was the subject of another passionate intervention in the liturgy debate. This one by Bishop Antonio Victor Paldain y Zapin from the Canary Islands, Spain. He called for the abolition of classes in the church and the fees and donations 
which determined a baptism or a wedding or a funeral that might, in fact, be celebrated. A private baptism, he described, could be a first class or a second class or a third class or even a seventh class event, depending on how much people donated. And this kind of abuse was targeted. He said money quite simply was getting in the way of God's reign of justice. His lengthy intervention, so lengthy that Cardinal Ruffini tried to stop it, was applauded. Maybe it was applauded because Ruffini tried to stop it. I'm not quite sure about that. But. Uh, and the article of Sacrosanctum Concilium that he's referring to in this discussion seems simple enough on the surface. It's Article 32. In the liturgy, apart from distinctions arising from liturgical function or sacred orders, and apart from the honors due to civil authorities in accordance with liturgical law, no special exception is to be made for any private persons or classes of persons, whether in the ceremonies or in external display. That's in the Constitution. Yet this was the subject of passionate exhortation. It was not a small thing. Listen to Bishop Pildain speaking on behalf of the poor who were receiving the seventh class of a baptism or a wedding or what have you. Quote, all will feel not only deeply humiliated but also deceived and mocked by us, Council Fathers, if we leave untouched this question, which is an exceedingly grave question of social justice not the social justice of the world, but that which is more serious still, it seems to me, the social justice of the church and the social justice of the liturgy. Bishop Kemmerer of Posadas, Argentina, speaking on behalf of a group of five South American bishops who undersigned his intervention, advocated the suppression of stipends and urged communal celebrations of baptism, confirmation, communion, and even weddings. Bishop Devoto of Goya, Argentino, argued that an end to fees should be made, as well as an end to public distinctions of wealth and class. The amendment Bishop Pildain uh, proposed to expand Article 32 was more fully incorporated into the first instruction on the right implementation of the Constitution, inter oikumenici in paragraphs 34, 35. That was issued even before the council was over. And it ends, that paragraph ends as follows. Pastors should, with prudence and charity, see to it that the equality of all the faithful is expressed, even externally, and that any appearance of money-making is avoided. Here, 50 years from the promulgation of Sacrosanctum Concilium, it is perhaps important to remember these things, to rediscover some of this history which doesn't exactly jump off the page, but which was there, which was part of the discussion of how do you reform the liturgy and what does it say about the people of God, how we gather, who the assembly is, how we're treated, who pays and who doesn't. It's perhaps worthwhile to make the subtle a little more clear. To, uh, to call forth the tokens of that solidarity which stands in the background to come to the foreground. In the ongoing task of boldly relating uh, social justice to liturgy and the needs of the poor, I think Pope Francis will help us. And that is, that is my hope. He has the heart for this, and he has already given us, I think, a good example. Overall, in appropriating Virgil Michael's legacy for today, what we are up against, I think, is amnesia. We've forgotten that the Constitution was formed for justice and formed for the flourishing of life together. We've forgotten that the liturgy is our greatest statement of who we are as the church, and that this reality is inescapably social. In today's welter of identity politics and other forms of 
what might be called tribalism or what I would call corporate individualism in our world and in our church, we've forgotten what makes for peace, self-emptying, humility, nonviolence. This is the Christ whom we worship in the liturgy, who must also be the inspiration of our common life, the one who emptied himself, becoming a slave even as we are, and so was raised up. So much easier to argue for self-interest, for me and mine. So much easier to build our little kingdoms than to build the kingdom of God. In today's world, it is more than ever necessary, I think, to listen again to what Virgil Michael was saying almost a century ago and what his legacy says to us still. It seems to me we have to recover also our courage, the courage to believe that the, of the liturgy that this will help. This is the answer to the disfigurements of our world. This will make our world whole again if we let it. The books, the teaching, the pamphlets, the movements, or today, even the blogs. Father Anthony will agree with me, I think. Even the blogs have a role to play and can be tools for social regeneration, for that being together in God's flourishing, in God's justice. The ferment of politics, the clash of expectations in the public sphere is rightly a place where believers take their stand and argue their convictions. But it's only through the liturgy that our efforts on behalf of justice will bear their sweet fruit by joining them to the work of Christ in the Paschal Mystery. I would like to give the last word here to Virgil Michael himself, that indefatigable yet also human and fragile saint of the liturgical movement and social justice. Michael once wrote an article summarizing a decade of liturgical progress that ended with these words. Much has been accomplished under God, yet almost everything still needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Frida. Let's take a five minute break for coffee, cookies, refreshments, a little bit of conversation, and we'll come back together for questions, observations, extensions, et cetera, okay? Just take five minutes. Um, it occurs to me that in the conversation that you described between Virgil Michael and the folks with Friendship House, um, that the yearning that he was addressing came out of their activism. That it wasn't sitting at liturgy feeling that it was meaningless. It was sort of immersion in the world. And he was saying, well, what you're looking for can be found in the liturgy. And when I, when I think about conversations that I've had about this topic. Can um, you tell me your name? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. I should introduce myself. My name is Kevin Lanave, and I I'm, I'm an alum from here, um, graduated in 1980 with a philosophy degree, and then I do social justice work in the area. Work a lot with, with youth. Um, I find that young people um, that I work with typically don't see the church as a source of inspiration for their yearning. Um, and it's I, partly because I think their experience of liturgy is not that meaningful. Their experience of parish community is not necessarily that meaningful. And I don't want to make that a blanket statement, but. But more often than not, young people that I've worked with, I taught in a Catholic school for 18 years, that so would get animated about social justice, don't currently go to the church for their inspiration. Um, and I work in secular settings too, and I can see where the, the work of social justice yields spiritual questions and spiritual hungers that liturgy could address. But I really do think there's something about like being immersed in that kind of activity before you recognize that, as opposed to like experiencing liturgy going like, oh, I think this calls me to social justice. I mean, I don't think it tends to work that way. That's, that's my experience. 
I, I, you know, I just respond to that. I thank you for, for offering that. I think that's a really profound reflection, and something that helps to, to tighten the focus on the dynamic uh, between liturgy and life that is fruitful for, for reflection. Uh, but to, to my mind, it's, uh, it has to be dialectical, and I'm sure you would agree that you know a little bit of this yeah. and a little bit of that then poses a deeper quest for this and for that. And uh, you know, I, I've just been struck lately by what Pope Francis has done, provoking people I know to say, you know, I never really thought about this before. Now I'm excited about maybe I should be active in doing things for the poor, you know? And it's, it's stuff like the, the washing of the feet that did it. So, so but, but at the same time, it, you're absolutely right. By doing things, you raise the questions. The questions may propel you into a new level. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Greg, Father Greg. Uh, Father Greg Miller, monk from St. John's, and I work in the inner city. And my experience is uh, working in a diverse community of English speaking, but it's a, a diverse community of African American, Anglo, uh, Asian, and then I have a Spanish mass. And um, what we try to do four times a year is have a unity mass where we uh, do bilingual uh, liturgies and to better integrate the community. But with the 40th anniversary here of Martin Luther King's uh, death, uh, the most segregated hour on, uh, of the whole week is Sunday morning, where we go to our own tribes and uh, uh, economic status uh, niches. And niches. And so <clears throat> liturgy really doesn't seem to be opening us up and breaking down boundaries. It seems to be reinforcing those boundaries. My experience is uh, unusual in the sense of the diversity uh, because a lot of uh, other parishes, in fact there is a Vietnamese parish just down the street from us that's just all Vietnamese and uh, there are Catholic parishes that are just all Mexicans and things but my parish is unique and I know we, we work at being inclusive um, but that didn't come necessarily from the liturgy. The liturgy helps. Um, so I do think the liturgy can be a great tool. That's my belief. Uh, but it doesn't happen by accident. So Sunday morning is still the most segregated hour in the United States, would be my takeaway. And as if there's something... Um, most Catholic communities will have that awful song, uh, All Are Welcome. And I say it's awful because I think it's phony uh, because um, it really means, no, you come and act like us uh, in, in that they really aren't welcoming. Uh, and I say that because I'm a, a white guy and I know that if a black person or Hispanic or street person walks in, they're really not welcome. And, and so for communities to, to be welcoming, they really have to take on a, a self-understanding. So I, I think with the changes in Vatican II, it makes the liturgy more naked, the, the community more naked. And, and that work of transforming of the community, I think, is uh, part of that where the social change hits the road or the rubber hits the, the, the road. Yeah, that, and if I may, thank you so much. Very, very good thought and I just to want to affirm your pastoral initiatives that sounds like that there's a, a, a great thoughtfulness and, and mm -hmm. persistence in doing those things and thank you. Uh, but also just wanted to make one comment which is that continually through the liturgy we are saying things that we don't live up to. <laughs> so I think we, the answer is to try to live up to them uh, rather than stop saying them because of, because you know the song some are welcome some are welcome wouldn't really you know 
<laughs> Many are welcome. <laughs> no, thank you, no, and this, and the, I mean, I think that this is one of the things that liturgy does to us, though, is also ask, asks us, is there a cognitive dissonance between the words we say and the way we're living? I, I'll tell you just a little personal story. My aunt, and this is a very older woman and grew up in a very different world from the world today, okay? Very racist world. All right. She was in a neighborhood change, uh, you know, in her neighborhood, and she's going to her parish church, and uh, she said to me, you know, my pastor keeps saying, brothers and sisters, you're all brothers and sisters, you're brothers and sisters. She said, I'm looking on one side, and there's a Hispanic person, I'm looking on the other side, there's a black person, I'm saying, oh, oh, I guess we are. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it sort of did work. I mean, she was surprised that we were brothers and sisters, which isn't good. But it was the church that pushed her, it pushed her sort of enclave mentality out of the little comfort zone and said, look at this. Not enough to just be with your own kind. Mm. Ivan. Ivan Kaufman from the Michael Sadler House, a Mennonite Catholic. It's my sad duty, and it truly is a sad duty, to ask how it is possible to reconcile military service with being an active participant in the liturgy. How is it possible to say we are gathered around a single table as a single mystical body of Christ and still give ourselves permission to kill each other in times of war? It's just impossible for those of us from a Mennonite background to avoid that question. And it's impossible for me not to ask if Virgil Michael in 1938, when he died, had he lived, would he have followed his friend Dorothy Day into the absolute pacifism that she adopted during World War II? And uh, you know, the Catholic worker got a lot of, lot of blowback on that. They suffered a lot from people feeling that they had uh, you know, abandoned their right to be called Catholic because they hadn't, uh, because they stuck to the principle of nonviolence there. And uh, there's no answer to your question that I, that I can give. I can only thank you for raising it. Does it, somebody else want to comment on this? I'm minded of a story I heard from, from a Benedictine woman from Erie, Pennsylvania, who had a very good friend, uh, uh, and uh, I, I think, in fact, she was, the, the person was related, and he served on a, a nuclear submarine for years, huh? devout Catholic, Eucharistic minister. The key to the tabernacle was in the same box as the key, or as the keys to the launch devices on the sub. And at a certain point, he said, I got, I got to get out of this service. I, I, these two things cannot mix anymore in my life. So, so in response, I'm thinking of some individuals will feel that, and it'll hit them between the eyes. Yes. Yes. Sir. Please. I am Paul Hudson from India. <clears throat> uh, I'm very happy and uh, I was very much impressed by your passionate presentation uh, of the significance of liturgy. And uh, <clears throat> what touched me most from uh, Virgin Michael's uh, quotations is this. And I think we are still doing that. We are doing much to the liturgy, not what liturgy does to us. I mean, if we are focusing on that, we will be very much uh, life-oriented. 
now we are very much business oriented. We cannot and we don't want our liturgy to be extended for another minute or two. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, but uh, you see, uh, we, we don't have any problem to watch a, a, a football or baseball for hours. I, I mean, this is what I, I was told when uh, somebody called me from Germany uh, uh, on the Holy Week. There, today, what is happening is the, the <coughs> fire target, the fire target, sin fry target. That means this, the days for celebration are day or holy days. Holy days means there is no celebration whatsoever. They sit at home or they go to the mountains or to the uh, seashore. I mean, we, we, are, we have failed. I think the ministers have failed. I don't say the people have failed. The ministers have uh, miserably failed to bring the very mystery and reality. You know, uh, that is what I, I, I could understand. Uh, he was trying to uh, balance in his approach. I, I have not read him. Uh, you have presented him. And uh, you have presented much more than what he would have presented today. Uh, that's what I feel. So life and liturgy should go hand in hand. And that is what he lived, and that is what the constitution on the liturgy is all about. And therefore, uh, you have struck a very uh, significant point. If we are paying attention to what happens in the liturgy, I think we will be transformed. Uh, we want to transform liturgy, and we want to have all kind of new things and changing all beautiful uh, artistic uh, uh, and uh, um, music uh, and also uh, that com community celebration is missing. You know, uh, everything should be within the time limit and liturgical time is not uh, within our time con uh, concept. And for that we have to turn to East, I suppose. Thank you. you you've said about five things in there that were just uh, very uh, interesting and I thank you for your comment. Uh, I, I, the, the tyranny of the clock is a, a very key element here, isn't it? Uh, I think it's one of the things that uh, um, is our way of control, uh, which can become idolatrous in uh, the improper use of that measurement of control, too. Sometimes it does take as long as it takes. Thank you very much. I want to say that tomorrow evening, uh, Rita will be giving the Diekman lecture. It'll be in the Stephen B. Humphrey Auditorium uh, at 8, uh, actually at 7.45 p.m. And the title of that major presentation is All Together Now, Catholic Unity and the Liturgy. Let's put our hands together for a wonderful presentation. And thank you.